Hello, welcome to Growth Track. This is session three of Old Testament survey. And I just want to go over quickly the assignment for those of you who are taking this for Bible college credit. You will um, pick a character or a person or some event that happened in from Genesis to Second Chronicles, and you are going to prepare a teaching, and you're going to deliver that teaching to the place of your choice. If you work in Quam Junior with children, you could deliver that volunteer in Quam Junior and deliver that message there. If you work, um, if you work, maybe if you're with the worship team, you might want to hit something that has to do with worship. You could also even just invite some friends over and just say, hey, friends, I have a Bible college class that I need to um, complete. Would you come over to my house for coffee and we can, um, I just can teach my lesson to you there. So you also have to read that book of the Bible that you prepare your teaching from. So I hope that clarifies the assignment for you if you're taking this for Bible college credit and you will go to um, churchoftheheartland.com, click on growth track and it will explain that um, on Old Testament survey. So we're going to open in prayer today as we um, study God's word, the Old Testament. Father, we just thank you for your word, God. We just thank you, God, that we can read the stories of people that you walked with and that you love, Lord, and that you um, led in, God, just led in their lives and in their, in their callings. And so today, God, we just lift up this time to you. We pray, Lord, that you just sear your word into our heart, God, and that we just draw in close to you, God, so that we can be near you, Lord, and um, just... Learn more about you because we love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, last week we talked about uh, Genesis. And um, just as a quick review, Genesis 1 to 12 talked about Adam. From Adam to Abraham is the story of the human race. And Genesis 12 to 50 is from Abraham to Jesus. And it's the story of the chosen race, Israel. So we're going to wrap up... Um, the last part of Genesis to lead into the book of Exodus because it just there's a little bit of a transition there. So really, students, you need to know that God oftentimes takes our tragedies and turns, that, turns it into some kind of triumph. He takes our brokenness and he makes something beautiful with it as we walk with him. You know, if you've, if you've been alive for any number of years, you know that there's going to be some great seasons of life and then there's going to be some difficult seasons of life. And these Bible, char Bible, Bible characters, you're going to see the same thing happen with them. Just because they knew God didn't mean that their life was easy. Just because they were the children of God didn't mean that it was smooth sailing for them as they um, lived their life out. So we're going to talk about Joseph, and he is near the end. It's just gonna, I'm just going to hit some high points on Joseph's life. His story is near the end of Genesis. And it's really a powerful inspiration to focus on God's faithfulness and not develop a um, victim mentality. If anybody could have had a victim mentality, I would say Joseph would be a good candidate for that. He, um, I, he's one of my, I have so many favorite stories, but right now today he's one of my favorite stories, okay? I just love Joseph's story because I think you can plug so many people's lives into it. And I bet there's something that he's gone through that you could identify with. So Joseph's mother died when he was young, right? So whew, he died when he was young. He didn't even get to grow up with her. His brothers, um, his brothers rejected him. They, and they hated him because he was kind of the favorite child of his father. Uh, and they hated him so much and they were so jealous of him that they, they, it was probably not the easiest just being in daily relationship with them, but in the end, they did throw him into a pit. And um, long story short, they sold him into slavery, right? So this, this boy was given dreams by God when he was young, and he, he shared his dreams, and his brothers just shot him down, and that made him even angry at, angrier at their little brother. And then um, when he was in slavery, he was accused of rape. And he didn't do it, but they threw him into prison. Do you think he had, he had the right to have a victim mentality? Probably so. But um, he, 
he just kept walking and he just kept walking with God. Really, some of these stories are going to remind you that bad things can happen to great people. Bad things can happen to good people, my friends. Um, and when bad things happen, we have a choice. We can either run to God for his comfort and for his direction and for his encouragement and hope, or we can harden our hearts toward God. And that is really not usually very productive for us. Joseph is the reflection of running to God and trusting his faithfulness. So one of the things that I would just want to encourage you about is like when you go through those difficult times, when you go through hard times, um, you need to remember that your story is still being written. You know, your story is still being written. Those hard times can happen, but that is not the end of the story. Um, really, the a beautiful thing is God's fighting for us. He is fighting for us. He is, there's another chapter ahead. Sometimes you're in, the, in a big plot in some part of your life and it's terrible. But um, I just want to reflect on what Joseph did. Joseph, the key to Joseph handling his life traumas was trusting that whatever he endured, God was with him. If you can grab a hold of that concept, it will change your life, my friends. You need to know that he is with you. If you've gone through some kind of trauma, join the rest of the people of God who also have. So Joseph um, did suffer a lot, but he walked into his higher call after years of suffering injustice and standing steadfast for God. You know what happened through those years of um, suffering and hardship? He really was formed into a humble and a very wise leader. All the pain, all of the um, suffering formed him into a humble man who trusted God. And at the end of his life, it was his brothers who had thrown him into slavery. God saw fit um, to restore that family. It was a powerful example of restoration. After years of rejection, pain, and separation from his family, he was not only reconciled to his family, he was used by God to save his family. Not just his family, but um, which was going to be the future and hatred of Israel, but many of the known world, at, much of the known world at that time. So through Joseph's story, we see the power of blessing that comes through forgiveness. I just want to encourage you on that point with, Joseph, with Joseph's story. If you want to, um, if you need to read a story in the Bible that will encourage you to, um, gosh, trust God and help him forgive you, read Joseph's story, really, because... Um, his story really reflects the restorative nature of Jesus. Jesus is the master healer. He's the master forgiver. And he really is the master reconciler. Um, let's go to Genesis 45, 4. You know, when Joseph's brothers, they didn't, know, they didn't even know it was him because he had been sent off to a foreign land. They thought he was probably dead. They suffered with guilt for years and years and years. And then... God brought his brothers before him, and this was, this was Joseph's response to his brothers. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer. And he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset, and don't be angry with yourself, with yourself for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you, to preserve your lives. Whew. That is the fruit, my friends, of walking with God. You know, we see in ministry so many people who ha are torn apart through sin, through lack of forgiveness, through um, pain of childhood. My goodness, sometimes that pain can cause people to do really, really... Um, really destructive things and the you're not you don't just it doesn't just end with the people who you who who offended you who wronged you um really there's some powerful scripture that talks in hebrews it talks about 
um, grace given to people. It actually says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now, if Joseph would have held on to all of his anger and pain, he could have had all of his brothers slaughtered, right? He could have had them thrown in jail, and then he would have, like, maybe had this false sense of just like, oh, you, you, you are going to pay now. But really, it's just more destruction. So, bitter roots can crowd grow up to cause trouble and defile many. So I am encouraging you, if you have something that, as we're talking about some of these things that, that come up and like start to, start to, to create that emotion, that, then that anger, get with God. Get with God and ask him to set you free. Show him how to help you forgive who it is that you have bitterness toward. Because usually um, the person that's set free is you. That's who's set free when you are, when you forgive. Not always easy, but possible with Jesus. Not always easy, possible with Jesus. So at the end of Genesis, the nation of Israel is just getting started. Jacob has his 12 sons and a daughter. Okay, um, one of his wives dies, but um, Joseph has such favor with the Pharaoh that the Pharaoh says, bring your family, bring your family up. And they lived in Egypt and Goshen. Genesis 46, 26 says the total number of Jacob's direct descendants who went with him to Egypt, not counting his sons, sons' wives, was 66. In addition, Joseph had two sons who were born in Egypt. So altogether, there were 70 members of Jacob's family in the land of Egypt. Now, near the end of Jacob's life, um, he... He knows it's his final days, and he calls his sons. They, move, they get moved to Egypt. I should like make sure I say that. They move everything, and now they're going to be planted and stay here for a little while in Goshen, Egypt. But near the end of Jacob's life, one of the things that he wanted to do is he wanted to speak into his, his children's lives. So he called them to him. Genesis 49.1 says, Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. In Genesis 49.2, um, it's kind of known as Jacob's blessings. Uh, uh, assemble and listen. Um, son of Jacob, listen to your father Israel. It's often called the blessing of Jacob. So it's the various blessings that he's going to speak over his sons, his children, are not just for his children, but they are going to be for the 12 tribes of Israel. So in the Old Testament, pronouncing blessing was a very powerful concept. And I want you to know it still is today. All right. The laying, on the, the laying on of hands in the Old Testament and speaking blessing over their children, it was, it, it, throughout scripture, um, the importance of the verbal blessing is expressed. The Old Testament term for blessing are mentioned over 600 times. Do you think it's important? Yes, that's a lot of times to mention blessing. To be blessed is to be granted special favor by God with resulting joy and prosperity. Don't we want that in our lives? Don't we want that in our children's lives? Don't we want them to have joy? We want them to, even if they didn't have monetary prosperity, you can prosper in your soul. You don't have to be rich to be prosperous, my friends. Don't confuse that. Joy is a blessing. The Israelites attributed unusual power to the spoken word. Once uttered, the word would practically take on a life of its own and continue in effect whether or not circumstances changed or the original speaker had a change of mind. Kind of cool, huh? Like even in Jacob's story, when Rachel deceived um, Isaac and the blessing went to Jacob, and then uh, um, Esau, his brother, came back and said, bless me, father, bless me, and his father said, I already blessed your brother. He could still speak blessings over him, but a verbal blessing is made up of um, three powerful forces. Our word, our spoken words, God's word, and God's name. 
You guys, you need to know there is power in what we say. There's power in our words. The power of our words alone is affirmed by the scripture that states death and life are in the power of the tongue. We're going to, God, we're created in the image of God. God spoke the world into existence, right? He spoke blessings over us. God's intention and desire to bless humanity is a central focus of his covenant relationship. So um, there's two ideas that are kind of present here. A blessing was a public declaration of a favored status with God. Kind of awesome, right? We want that favor of God. And the next thing is the blessing endowed power for prosperity and success. So the blessing served as a guide and a motivation to pursue a course of life within the blessing. So um, I'm just going to encourage you. And I think you know it to be true. There's still power in blessing. Be encouraged to lay hands on your children and speak blessing over them. To lay hands on your spouse and speak blessing over them. If you're in ministry, lay hands and speak blessing over children. You know, this year, 2020 is kind of a famous year. It's a year like none that we've ever experienced in my lifetime. And um, something beautiful came out of 2020 in March. Um, Numbers 6, 24 through 26. See if this sounds familiar to you. I love this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So in March, March 20th, 2020, a song was released into our country, into the nations. Carrie Job was a part of writing the song and an elevation worship team, part of their worship team. And, um, The name of the song is The Blessing. Now, this powerful song is currently traveling around the globe. It is shocking how many people are singing this blessing. I went to go, we did it for um, the class of 2020 in Rochester, and we were picking out a song to sing, and we sang The Blessing. So we were, I was Googling things on, um, just YouTubing things, and it was a jaw dropper for me. I heard the blessing, this song that was written March, it was released March 20th, March 1st, I think is the first time they sang it in church. It is being sung in Israel, in Hebrew. It's being sung in France, in French. It's being sung in Portuguese, in Brazil. So if you Google, or I'm sorry, if you go to YouTube and just type in the blessing, um, this is what Carrie Job, how she introduced the song on March 1st. She told the church that the, lyric, the lyrics represented the heart of the Father toward us, his kids, and invited them to re- receive the song as a blessing over you and your family and your children. Here's some of the words. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. It's right out of the Bible, isn't it? Right out of Numbers. And then it goes on to say, Amen. They're saying, Amen, so many times. So be it, so be it, so be it. Right? May his favor, may his favor be upon you. And a thousand generations. (laughs) Man, whew your family, your children, and their children, and their children. May his presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you. He is with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing, 
He is for you. He is for you. Hmm. May his favor be upon you to a thousand generations. <laughs> you know, I just encourage you. When I listen to the song, if I think about it, I can just weep because God is speaking into, into your family, into your home, into our communities, into our nation, into Japan, into Asia, the word of God, the blessing of the Father. May his favor be upon us to a thousand generations, to your children and your children's children. God's tricky. I like it. I love it. Right? He is a God who loves his people. In the midst of a pandemic, he knew this song was needed to bring hope and to speak into the spiritual climate the blessing of the Lord to a thousand generations. So let's go back to Abraham's blessing. And so the blessing God spoke over Abraham will follow his descendants and us as followers of Jesus. And that blessing, was, once again, was um, God's blessing spoken to Abraham was Genesis 12 2. This blessing applies to us, my friends, okay? It applies to Israel, the Jewish people, and the adopted Jews, which are us. Genesis 2 12 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Let's stand on what God is saying, my friends. Let's continue to stand on what God is saying. So at the close of Genesis, the nation of Israel, which would be Abraham's grandson, Jacob, and his great-grandsons, Jacob's children, were about 70 people. And then they were going to go into a new, a new era, so to speak. So in Joseph's lifetime, the, Israel had great favor with that pharaoh. But those, that generation died, okay? And they started to be fruitful and multiply. That what, that's what God told them to do. The nation of Israel exploded in, in Egypt, in um, Goshen, Egypt. They were there for about 430 years. That's a long time. That's a lot of generations, right? Okay, that's quite a few generations. They were fruit, fruitful and multiplied to between 2 to 3 million people. So we're going to go now into the book of Exodus. That sounds great, doesn't it? Like they kept more Israelites, more children of God, more blessings on the earth. But when the um, when um, in the start of Exodus, there was new leadership who were threatened <laughs> by the numbers, the great, the sheer numbers of the Israelites. So Exodus, is, the theme of Exodus is deliverance and redemption. The purpose is to record the events of Israel's deliverance from Egypt and their development as a nation. So there are so many amazing Bible stories in Exodus. If you, if anybody says, God's nature is just supernatural. If you see some of these events and you read them with fresh eyes or listen to them with fresh ears, it is amazing how God shows himself to people. One supernatural event after another. So in, um, there's kind of four different um, periods in the, of Israel's history in the book of Exodus. One period at the start, they're going to be put into slavery. They are going to, the, the powers that be were threatened by them. They, there, was a, there were a lot of them, so they, were, they became cruel taskmaster, taskmasters to the Israelites, to the Jewish people. So they went into this season of cruel slavery. Um, that's when, like, well, well, then another season is the period of deliverance. And that is going to be God's divine intervention in their history, or in that, in that period of um, time in Exodus. Another period 
is a period of discipline where they need to learn how to walk with God. They need to learn who he is and who they are as his people. And then another period of legislation and organization. Okay, if you open up your Bibles to Exodus 1. Exodus 1, 8 says, Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said, the Israelites have become too numerous for us. So the king of Egypt at that time feared them so much that he tried to enforce population control. That is still happening in different um, countries of the world. I'm sure you know that, but it is still happening. It's horrible. But at that time, they told the midwives, if, you, if the Israelite women deliver a baby boy, kill the baby boy, the, the midwives feared God and they made up all kinds of excuses. Oh, they give birth really quick, quickly. We can't get there in time. They've already had the baby. We can't do it. They were trying to do, it, do a sneaky route of trying to kill the boys. And then they just flat out said, take the ba any baby boy and throw them in the Nile River. Drown the baby boys. We're going to control this population. Enough of this. So as you can imagine, God's people, in this time of brutal um, cruelty, they cried out to God. So God heard the cries of his children and the plan was already in motion. So born into this season by a supernatural rescue was Moses. He was born for such a time as this. He was gonna be, he was, he was preserved. He should have been killed. He should have been drowned in the river, but his mom loved him and built a little a little crib for him that floated down the river. And then super, God's supernatural intervention put this baby into the hands of Pharaoh's own daughter. So not only did he, didn't he die, he was raised with a very good education, Egyptian education, and um, he walked, he was, he was his, God's hand was on him obviously from birth. So Moses' life story is a beautiful picture of how God chooses normal people. He walks closely with them, and then he equips them to display the glory of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? He was a baby that should have been killed. What God can do with the life, he's just an example of it. But, okay, he had to go through quite a journey. So Moses' name actually means drew him out of the water. Moses was born to the tribe of Levi. Okay, that becomes more, it be makes more of a difference as um, the, this period of legislation and organization happens. But um, so he's born to Levi parents and he was um, raised and reared in a royal household. So let's go to Exodus 2. Now, Moses is growing up. He's growing up in his royal palace, but a changeover must have happened, okay, in his life. He suddenly realized that his, the people were being oppressed. His very own people were being oppressed. Exodus 2, 11. One day after Moses had grown, had grown up, he went out to where his own people, the Israelites, were, and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. So what he did was like, he was probably enraged. He saw uh, senseless beating and cruelty, and he took matters into his own hands, and he killed the Egyptian. He was probably just enraged, and he just like went off on him, right? So he developed a new awareness and compassion for his people's suffering. So he was reacting to this enormous problem in a very emotional way. We can do the same thing. He sees his countrymen being abused, takes manners into his own hands, and kills, um, kills this man. He sees this social injustice, knows it's wrong, and he's just going to do something fast. He's going to like... He's just, 
out of his mind because he's so distressed about it. We're seeing a lot of that happen in 2020, aren't we? We're seeing a lot of people become aware because we've had a little bit more time, uh, time at home. We're becoming aware of things and some people are taking matters into their own hands. Some people are doing things that are not going to solve the problem. They are creating problems in and of themselves, aren't they? Okay. We can't just expect social justice and social change to happen if we, we see the injustice and we react to the injustice and we go on a, on a killing spree, right? It doesn't work. So we will come back in a moment.